Now, our next speaker has been the Tanaka Chair Professor in the Electrical and Electronic Engineering as well as Computing Departments at Imperial College. He serves as the Head of Communications and Signal Processing Group in the Triple E Department at Imperial. He received the Distinguished Member of Technical Staff Award from AT&T Bell Labs, the Royal Society Wolfson Research Merit Award, and became a member of Academia Europea in 2012 and an IET Fellow in 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Kin K. Leong. Hello, I hope uh, you can hear uh, my voice and my screen. Uh, thank you very much for your very kind uh, introduction. Um, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, literally, I'm hosting some visitors from Singapore. And while I'm connecting to you um, to give a speech in Singapore here, this is a water coincidence. The world is well connected. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. And um, uh, I show my first slide. I include uh, our landmark at Imperial College, which is the Queen's Tower. In case you have not visited uh, Imperial, um, you are uh, um, uh, invited to, to come for a visit. Uh, for today's talk, uh, I would like to focus on reinforcement learning for control of um, communication infrastructure. And as, as I shown on this slide, I have a large number of uh, collaborators working with me on this subject, and um, we like to acknowledge their contribution in the content uh, to the content of my uh, presentation here. So let us um, let, let let me move on. Let me step through. Yes, um, I would like to introduce a concept uh, based upon on software defined network, which is an extension of software defined network ST, SDN. Uh, primarily, we introduce a concept called SDC. Um, the SDC is actually um, can be viewed um, as just um, extending um, uh, the SDN, which is focused primarily on communication. Now we allow to um, um, the network to include um, uh, data servers, uh, data stor um, storage, and other uh, resources. So as we understand the concept of SDN, essentially all the resources will be grouped uh, in, in one domain. This one domain typically belong to the same organization, uh, company, and other uh, same department. So you have different uh, domain of resources uh, including communications and uh, data servers uh, resources and but uh, domains are connected uh, together to form the network. So as the diagram shown imply here, um, all the data links connecting different um, uh, different domains together at the bottom here uh, form so-called the data plane. Uh, this is the plane the communication um, uh, facilities supporting uh, linking the um, uh, providing transfer of user data. And then um, the resource will be controlled by, um, it, within its domain, will be controlled by a controller. So each domain would have one controller like this. And then the controller need to link up among themselves so that they form the control plane. So essentially, let's say uh, for sh sharing resources across um, domains, then we rely on the controllers uh, communicating among themselves to coordinate in, uh, such uh, sharing of resources across domains, or even uh, for the matter of um, using the communication resources um, to support communication. So this is the setting we are considering um, uh, because uh, there are a lot of work going on to, in the industry, in the academia, uh, to work on SDN um, uh, um, network, but we are extending um, uh, beyond just the com communication. Uh, we consider other resources as well. And uh, the focus here, uh, as our work um, um, developed, the focus, our focus is to uh, enable um, all domains, different domains, belong to different organizations 
kind of join up dynamically together. So, um, so we have a dynamic um, uh, situation here instead of being stationary. And secondly, the focus here is to allow sharing of resources across uh, the domains. Uh, and uh, for the, to support that, then you would expect the, uh, uh, the controller to have constant communication among themselves to update each others regarding the status of the um, resource within each domain. Otherwise, we cannot have effective uh, sharing of resources across domain. And so the challenge, one of the challenges we have is um, we have the so-called controller synchronization problem, which I will discuss a bit more because I would like to use this um, uh, as an example to illustrate how reinforcement learning will be useful. And um, we also need to um, um, uh, develop um, sophisticated techniques to allow sharing of resources across domains because what's, what's the purpose of the S uh, SDC? Uh, software um, defined coalition is to enable different partners, different coalition partners to share uh, resources. So it's not a simple problem, and but we need to develop new techniques to, uh, to support that kind of sharing. And now, as you can see, the whole SDC here is actually a very um, agile, very dynamic, distributed processing environment, if, if you can think of that way. Uh, depend on where you are coming from, whether coming from communication perspective or coming from computer computing capability perspective. Nevertheless, the whole infrastructure um, can be uh, can definitely be used to support uh, distributed um, machine learning, distributed analytic applications. So that is one area uh, we have to consider how we can make use of such infrastructure uh, to support uh, different kinds of ap applications. Now, so this is the setting. Um, we have been working on, all right? And actually this setting, um, uh, SDC setting, is not, um, uh, has a lot of overlap related uh, to the so-called cloud computing, which we are so familiar with. Um, and, um, <coughs> but the emphasis would uh, actually be slightly different. For cloud com computing, we have the infrastructure at the bottom. We have a platform to support different applications. So the app, the, 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 we have a lot of end users trying to make use of different apps, uh, different um, um, storage, uh, computational capability. And uh, so that is what is cloud uh, computing is all about. And there are a lot of uh, very uh, popular cloud uh, applications uh, like Google Map and Dropbox and uh, famous uh, YouTube, Netflix, and those uh, are applications running on the, on the cloud. But if you look at the relationship between cloud and SDN, essentially you can see there's a quite a bit of overlap, okay? And um, uh, because cloud can be running on the platform, the platform, the network is actually, the infrastructure is actually S uh, SDC network or S SDN network. So that's a relationship. So we are not, uh, when we deal with the SDC, so, uh, software defined coalition is not um, uh, so different from what we have been using all along. Now, let me come back to the, um, um, uh, the issue uh, to illustrate a little bit about the uh, so-called SDC synchronization, um, controller synchronization. What are the issues there? The issue is um, we want to share resources. Let's say I have a user here. I would like to uh, share resources in this domain. So what it means is um, the controller um, uh, initially, with um, each each domain has the controller. The controller knows exactly the status of the resources, what resources will be available, what is um, congested, and how how much spare capacity we can we can share. So each controller knows its own domain. But yet, when I share resources across domain, that means I need some resource in the black. In, in the red domain, but also I need some resource in the green domain as well as um, the yellow domain. That means the corresponding controller must coordinate, must uh, interact with each other so that uh, to support the sharing of my uh, resources to support my application. Now then it brings the question, the question is um, um, the information um, possessed 
by each domain regarding the neighboring uh, domains must be updated. If the info status information is not updated, there's no way that we can have effective sharing, resource sharing me mechanism. So if we have updated information, that, that means the controller must exchange status information among themselves. Uh, however, there's a cost associated with it. The more often we, uh, we synchronize, then it's the more overhead. Then we understand the performance of sharing will be better because we are updated information. Uh, the opposite is also true. Then the question is, what is the good controller synchronization policy? Namely, when and which pair of controllers should synchronize their update each other regarding their um, respective resource uh, status in their domain. And uh, for the given um, uh, performance metric and, and, and some budget, because we can synchronize every single uh, second, uh, every single, uh, at every moment, we can do that, but uh, we have a budget for that. So we have to subject ourselves to develop this kind of um, um, synchronization policy uh, subject to our constraint. So that is the, this is the problem I would like to use to, um, to capture, uh, to, you, to illustrate how reinforcement learning can be useful. All right, as I said um, in my um, introduction, uh, I would like to, uh, I mean, the abstract, um, uh, um, I would like to give a very high level introduction of um, um, reinforcement learning. And if you look at the reinforce, look at the reinforcement learning technique, the fundamental um, mathematical um, uh, form, um, um, formalization is actually so-called the Markov decision process. So the idea is this. I have some system, I call this environment. This system is very, very general uh, and very flexible. It could be very large system and it can be only a, one single computer system and um, maybe a very large communication network, but here is the environment. So we have an agent here. The agent can make some observation from the environment. We call this state. Okay, so essentially it's the status of your system. And then the agent would, um, uh, among, given the, the state of your system, your, of your environment, the agent would uh, select the best action, okay, to take. And then it would take the action and apply the action to the environment. And because of the um, action is uh, taken, then the environment status will change. The state of the system will change from the current state to the next state. Okay. And um, uh, at the same time, um, uh, the agent can uh, receive some reward because of the action taken given the current uh, previous state of the system. So the idea of the agent is to go in through some learning process and trying to learn what action uh, is the best over time so that I can maximize my long-term uh, reward. So, so that is what, um, in essence, what the Markov decision process MDP is doing. All right. Without going to the math, this is the, this is the fundamental uh, essence of the basic essence of the uh, MDP. And that is the mathematical, um, 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 uh, backing uh, or principle of um, reinforcement learning. So, um, if you, then if you look at reinforcement learning, then you can you can see it has the um, the learning part as well as the control part because the learning is to learn what kind of control policy action policy you should take. Action is control. You know, you want to control something. You want to take some action to control things, and <laughs> so, um, so that's an excellent control part. But it's also learning. Learning is in the sense that the agent may not know initially how to make decision, how to select the action to take in order to maximize the long-term reward. But it slowly, slowly takes some action which may not be optimal at the beginning, but then slowly, slowly, oh, if I take this, if I'm this date, and I am taking this action, then I see a lot of reward. That is the good thing to do. That's a good action. Slowly, slowly, the agent would learn 
uh, and uh, acquire that knowledge. And that is the learning part of reinforcement learning. Uh, sounds everything is okay, but uh, then we run into trouble. The trouble is um, as the system become complicated, let's say it's a large infrastructure, large, um, uh, let's say even um, um, within, uh, within a university setting, you have many departments, they have the computer system, they all talk to each other, share resource, computational resources. You can, you can easily find um, the so-called the stay and action space becomes so large. And because you have so many possible states of your system and you have so many combinations of states and action pairs, then you can possibly uh, take, uh, occur. As, as, a, as a result um, of this large uh, state action space, then it would take um, a lot of data uh, and if possible at all, uh, in order to train the, the agent because the agent has to learn initially. Uh, and so it takes a long time to train. So we have a, um, a lot of difficulty in uh, uh, developing the, uh, the policy when the system uh, is large. Uh, there are many possible solutions um, I list down here and, and try to tackle this so-called uh, state exposure uh, problem. And I will... Um, um, go through one or two of them, just to illustrate uh, precisely how we can tackle this um, state exposure uh, issue. All right, so far, let's, so far so good. So let's move on to go back to our controller synchronization problem. Okay, so let's use a very specific um, uh, example just to illustrate the point, all right? And then you can see um, you can generalize this um, uh, for other uh, application scenario, problem scenarios you want to apply reinforcement learning to. The question is this, okay? Let's say I have, um, I have, I, I need to find a path, a communication path across multiple domains, uh, from domain one on the left, all the way going through different domains, um, and finally, I would like to reach uh, some place um, uh, in domain eight. So I would like to um, find a path. Let's say uh, I want to find a path. Uh, let me use different color uh, of pen. And uh, let's say I, um, I want to find a path connecting me to here and, and going through, this is the path I need to go through and in order to reach from all the way from the left to the right. Um, so let's say I define what's the good path for me. Let's say, so for simplicity, I want to uh, define the number of hops uh, um, along the path. The number of hops along the path is in a reflection of the quality. I want to minimize the number of hops, um, which is often related to the delay uh, passing through the path. Um, so, so obviously, um, as we said, um, the controller um, in domain one would obviously know exactly all the paths that are uh, all the link status. Okay. And um, uh, also, um, uh, so is for controller for domain two. So each domain um, 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 has the controller, the controller knows exactly the status of each um, uh, within the domain. But in order to find the best path from domain one on the left to, the, to domain eight on the right, we need all the domain controllers to have some understanding of the status within all eight domains. Otherwise, we won't be able to find the best path. Okay, all right, suppose then, then, then this is where the problem of the uh, controller synchronization. The synchronization is, uh, is to identify some way, some, some way um, the controller, um, uh, controllers will synchronize with each other, okay? So, so that is the, um, uh, uh, the policy, synchronization policy we need to uh, develop. Okay, so how can we use, um, uh, uh, Markov decision passes to, um, uh, to handle that. Now, let's say um, we define the state 
this is the state definition um, um, of um, um, of this system. The state is um, um, each state is a vector. Is each state is a vector? Okay. In this case, is a vector of um, um, uh, seven numbers. Okay. The number represent. Let's say this is five. Represent uh, the time elapsed since the last time domain one um, synchronized with the corresponding domain. In this case, five means that has been five time units since domain one controller synchronized with domain two controller. Okay, so uh, 40 here is, this that has been 40 time units um, since domain one synchronized with domain eight. Okay, this is the state of the system. And um, the action, um, what's the action? The action is in, the, in this time slot, and whenever you see zero means that uh, domain one is not going to be synchronized with domain two, okay? Uh, instead, in this case, it's a vector, um, and this one indicating that at this time slot, the policy is to say domain one was synchronized with domain six, okay? No other um, domain. In this case, we are subject to this constraint, namely in each time slot. Um, domain one controller would only synchronize with um, one one of the um, one of the remaining controllers, only one. Okay, so this is the constraint that we have. And then, if you look at the um, reward, what's the reward? Okay, uh, the reward we define is the reduction of the latency after the synchronization. Because once domain one synchronizes with the the another controller, that means Domain one would know, let's say domain six, the most updated link status in domain six. Then when uh, domain one wants to find a, the best path from one to eight, domain one to eight, then knowing the updated information would be very helpful. Okay. And then um, um, the reward is to reflect the improvement of the latency by knowing the updated information. And then we, uh, what we want to maximize, we want to maximize the uh, exponential decay um, of um, reduction of delay. Uh, and that is the um, um, uh, formulation of our MDP. Then obviously I would like to highlight here what, why, what's going on here. What the situation is within each domain, um, there will be some of the nodes are mobile. So the, the communication links are not up all the time. Some of them would fail. Some of them are not doing well. And some of the, some links, new link will be uh, set up. So, so there are a lot of dynamics uh, going on within each domain. And the fact is that the dynamics within each domain would differ from the other domain. Then you can see from here, let's say, you can see here is 40 time units. That means 40 time units since domain one controller synchronized with domain eight. You would think um, um, probably that in the next coming time slot, domain one should synchronize with domain eight contro uh, controller because it's been 40 time units. However, uh, we, we do not necessarily need to go with the, um, the longest uh, elapsed time, but instead, the policy is to say, I don't synchronize, domain one controller doesn't synchronize with the controller eight. Instead, we synchronize with domain uh, six. The reason is because of the dynamics in each domain um, uh, is different. Therefore, even though there's been longest time since the domain eight has been syn synchronized with um, domain one controller, but if the, let's say if domain eight is very stable, it hardly has any change. It doesn't really matter how much time it has, okay? It has um, elapsed since the synchronization with the uh, control one, uh, controller one. Then, so the, the essence is to let the reinforcement learning to learn the dynamics of the system because learning the dynamics through observing the reduction of your delay. So then we will figure out, ah, because um, um, perhaps domain six has a lot of a di uh, dynamic situation. 
then uh, a lot of link changes, a lot of uh, ups and downs within the domain, then domain one controller should synchronize with domain six more often. So, so going through the learning uh, would help us to automatically sort out which one, uh, what's the best way to, which pair of uh, controllers to synchronize with domain, um, uh, uh, with synchronize with each other. I hope to give you the essence of why reinforcement learning or the MDP would be helpful in, in this kind of solving this kind of problem. I use this as an illustrative example. You can think of many, many other um, scenarios where um, you can formulate your problem as MDP and then use reinforcement learning technique to solve. It's very, very general uh, technique, okay? Although I have to say it has also has some limitation, but by far it's very applicable. Now, um, okay, well, then we, we formulate the problem with, uh, as uh, MDP, then we have to solve it. What does it mean by solving it? We have to find the policy, you know, namely for a given for a given um, um, a state, okay, um, what kind of action, given state, and I'm taking this action, and um, I have to determine given state, what kind of action I should take in order to maximize my long-term reward. So I don't want, I don't have time to go through the mathematics, but essentially it boils down to um, the so-called Bellman um, optimality equation. So the idea is, let's say the optimal actions it represent a sequence of actions. If I say I have a sequence of actions which are optimal, then every subsequence of actions I'm taking must be also optimal, okay? Otherwise, there's no way that I can get the, a sequence of um, uh, uh, actions to be optimal. And that is the um, uh, Bellman um, optimality equation. And then you can actually de uh, define so-called the Q value, the Q value of um, a particular policy, um, uh, associated uh, with each state and action pair. So essentially this Q value reflects, um, given the current system state is S, and what's the value of uh, taking action A according to this policy? And, and obviously this value must be reflecting the re long-term reward, you uh, weighted uh, exponentially weighted reward that we were talking about. So, so essentially is to find such um, um, a policy, action policy, and uh, so that we can maximize the long-term reward. And the problem uh, is that uh, um, we cannot solve, uh, if, if the problem is um, uh, uh, small, namely the combination of states and action pairs is small, then you can solve it by, um, you know, table lookup, or you can solve it by uh, tabular uh, techniques. You send to the form a table and then you can sort it out. However, when the number of states is large and, and also number of action pair, uh, actions uh, is also large, then you cannot solve. On the other hand, then we can uh, introduce the concept of um, using of a deep neural network. So essentially the deep neural network is to uh, uh, serve as an approximation and um, uh, to approximate the Q value given every single S and A, and W is actually the uh, parameter um, model parameter associated with the uh, neural network. And then if we can uh, train uh, this uh, neural network properly, then we get um, uh, to the optimal Q values. From the Q value uh, for different S and A pair, then uh, we can identify what's the best uh, action we should take for a given uh, state S. So in order to train, uh, then we typically use this law, define this loss function. Essentially, this is L2 norm uh, loss function uh, people normally use to train your neural network. All right, with, with that, I, I, would, I would show one scenario, uh, some numerical uh, uh, examples to illustrate the uh, performance gain we can possibly get by reinforcement learning. So what is shown here is, um, some networks um, um, with some number of domains and also the uh, corresponding parameter, 
what I shown here on the um, uh, of the on left hand upper uh, plot is horizontal axis is the training time as we go through the training, and then the vertical axis you can think of is actually is the enhancement or the reduction of the latency for the path for the routing path you select. Remember, we use routing uh, path as an example. So um, the um, the bottom curve here, which is black, essentially this is a fixed frequency. That means um, um, uh, I always come up with a fixed schedule. Domain one controller synchronized with three, and then next time with five. So you go through the periodic um, uh, frequency. Every pair of the um, controllers will have the uh, fixed um, frequency um, for synchronization. And then um, the um, the light green one here essentially is uh, is the uh, random. So you randomly pick, you know, um, who you want to synchronize with. Okay, and then the uh, the learned the reinforcement learning is the uh, darker darker green uh, performance. So you can see uh, reinforcement learning indeed can help can gain a lot because what the reinforcement learning is trying to um, uh, learn from the observation of the reduction of your enhancement of your routing decision. Okay, and and as we learn, then we will say, ah, this domain is uh, changing a lot in terms of status of the links and everything. So the synchronized uh, controller with with corresponding controllers will synchronize itself more, update uh, each others with their status more often. So that is the essence of the uh, reinforcement learning. So you can see on uh, um, setting after setting, we have significant performance gain by using uh, reinforcement learning. Now, as I mentioned, um, uh, reinforcement learning um, uh, is a very uh, uh, powerful technique, but we do run into the um, uh, uh, state explosion, uh, action explosion uh, problem. And um, we have a set of techniques to address them. And I would like to, um, including this is called action, state action separable reinforcement learning. And um, uh, there's some other techniques um, like uh, state decomposition, um, um, hierarchical um, uh, MDP, uh, decentralized MDP. Um, but I don't think I would have time. I would defer you to um, uh, my website. You can go Google me, uh, Google my name, go to Google Scholar. You will find uh, my uh, my papers on a variety of um, uh, issues. Um, and here I would like to quickly mention about the um, state action separable reinforcement uh, learning as a way to overcome the state exposure and action, action space uh, issue. Okay, what? What was the essence of the um, of the um, the technique? Um, basically, if you look at the traditional way uh, to solve the enforcement learning problem, is to consider the current state of the system, and then you take certain action, and then you get some reward. Okay, and obviously. Uh, what matters is to maximize your return, maximize your reward, you know, based on the state and action pair. And that is where the explosion, there's so many combination of state and action. So, but nevertheless, um, the idea is to have this so-called uh, state action value function. What it means is that given certain state S, you take certain action, and that is the corresponding return or the value you have. That's what the actions, uh, that's uh, what you would like to optimize. And remember, it's the combination of S and A, the action that causes trouble. Then for a lot of um, problems, we observe that we don't, we, don't need, we don't really need to capture S and A um, uh, uh, simultaneously. What matters is, what is the current state? Forget about your action at this moment. What's the next state? Now, give you an example. Um, I, have, um, I have a minefield here on the right-hand side. So I have an agent. 
the agent is trying there's some mines um some mines um uh, put on the ground in this minefield so the agent is to make some decision how to move around okay in this mi minefield hopefully there's some exit door um in the minefield the agent would like to um go to this exit without stepping on the mine okay otherwise you blow up yourself so so what matters is um, in this case, um, it's important to capture what's the current state, namely the current position of the agent, and what's the next um, position of the of, of the agent, regardless of what action you are taking, because the next position will tell you whether you step on a mine or not. So, so now you can see this is the um, we can the important part is what's the current state S, and what's the next state next position of the agent. And then the action we can consider as a additional piece of information, but not as um, jointly, uh, uh, as the way we jointly consider S and A together in the original formulation. So with that, so what we can develop is actually um, um, capture so-called the um, state, um, uh, consider the current state, and the next state, and then we come up with the reward. Okay, so we call this the state transition value function. Okay, and then um, so now we have a state s and s prime, and then we get the uh, the reward. So that tells us about uh, how good the next state is, not the action that you take yet. Okay, however, to consider the uh, the action, we we consider. Um, um, Based on the uh, state transition value um, uh, function, then we kind of be using supervised learning to remember actually when we have transition from S to X, S prime, because we know what action has been uh, has been taken. So we learn an other uh, simpler uh, supervised learning transition model to to map the state transition from S to S prime to the corresponding action, then we can have the complete picture. Okay, so you can see essentially we break the S and A combination to S to S prime and then consider A. Uh, all right, so essentially you can come up with this um, 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 uh, new method. That's the reason why we call this uh, state action um, uh, separable. We separate the state transition from the action. And then using this method, you can see from here, there's some numerical assessment. So the performance of the new method comparing with some other existing method is um, the method is sitting at the, at the uh, uh, represented by dark blue here, is um, much better than other existing method for different type of uh, scenarios. So this method can uh, perform fast, uh, can learn faster, and then um, using uh, less um, uh, uh, resources and require less uh, memory. All right, I'm going to skip some other uh, techniques which also help us to uh, uh, tackle the um, um, state explosion, action explosion uh, problem. But I would like to highlight one uh, uh, ongoing work that we are talking about. Okay, and the idea here is we have. Um, we try to use reinforcement learning to control a very large system, okay? Let's say each sub, the large system is broken down into subsystems. You can call it domain, okay? It doesn't really matter. So the, the big system consists of very large number of subsystems. You can think of each subsystem can be managed by one agent, okay? You have multiple agents in this case. However, in order to support the, let's say, the resource sharing across domain, the agents must work together. They cannot work just on them on their own because they, they have uh, their requests. We have to make use of resources in other domains. So one possible uh, solution is to have hierarchical reinforcement learning. Namely, we have another global agent sitting at the top. Each local agent would talk to the global agent to kind of a synchronize and try to coordinate the action so that overall they work together in optimal way. 
But then we also run into a problem is that um, the, the same, uh, same state expulsion problem uh, still occur because how much information the local agent have to tell the global agent? If we tell the same detailed information, then the global agent uh, must have a very, very large state space because of the efficient products uh, of the state space. So we have to address the, um, the state space uh, issues in this kind of hierarchical and um, distributed or multi-agent scenarios. This is an ongoing research work. So um, it's very fascinating because in our world, we can expect um, have a single agent to cover everything. Instead, we must have multiple agents uh, due to various reasons. Maybe domain, different domains belong to different owners. Different owners would like to have their own agents, uh, reinforcement learning to control their own subsystems and subnetwork. So we can, we can, can ask them to uh, uh, fit everybody into a single, uh, single controller and also a single centralized controller would not be, uh, agent would not be scalable anyway. So the problem of multi-agents, distributed agent for reinforcement learning is going to be there and uh, there are many uh, issues remain open waiting for us to work on. Okay. So I skipped this, um, uh, how to combine um, uh, reinforcement learning with transfer learning when the environment is changed. And here's the, the list of um, um, publications. I think the best way is to, um, as I shown at the bottom here, just Google my name and, um, and you can find um, my papers on my website. Okay. So this is what I have. And um, I, I hope um, I would have some time to answer your questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kin K. Leong, for that inspiring presentation on deep reinforcement learning for control of large scale communication infrastructures. And uh, we'll now move on to the question and answer segment, starting with this first question that we have here. And it is As machine learning is so popular, how much does that represent a hype in the area of? communication networks and of course the hype is in uh, inverted commas <laughs> so yeah <laughs> thank, thank you uh, I th thank you um, this is a very important question uh, um, I I start to work on uh, reinforcement learning um, um, in the last several years and I I to be honest I start with a very skeptical mind uh, I didn't want to kind of jump onto the bandwagon just for the sake of um, uh, um, working on something, uh, you know, kind of hot. And, but from my own experience, I honestly can say uh, reinforcement, uh, in general, machine learning techniques can solve some problems which we didn't know how to solve or uh, it's not easy to solve in the past. So there's some very important uh, value by using uh, machine learning techniques in solving our problem. Having said that, as researchers, we have to be objective. We have to be honest. And telling colleagues, you know, um, machine learning can be helpful in this way and that way. When we see some shortcoming, don't hesitate to tell people, hey, we, 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 we have difficulty there also. But from my own experience, I can say it's very uh, machine learning techniques in general for specifically for communication network uh, management and control is, um, is, is, a, is a new mine uh, we can get into and then you can take whatever you want. It's a gold mine. We can take whatever you want to do. The basic uh, reason is if you look at the reinforcement learning uh, um, uh, technique, essentially the state description is multidimensional. It can be huge dimension, okay? Has large, very hard, large dimension uh, to describe the state. And what the machine learning um, technique is trying to explore the relationship between the state elements 
um, you know, of your state description, or in general, if you have a web, uh, you have a data item which is multi-dimensional, machine learning techniques can explore the relationship, very complicated, a very complicated relationship among the um, 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 uh, elements of your your or of your data, and this is really really powerful. The relationship can be much sophisticated than any mathematics so we can we can write down including nonlinearity including uh, temporal characteristics of your data so i think i think it has a machine learning is not just a hype machine learning is something real in my opinion thank you so much uh, prof for that well elaborated answer and we've got a couple more questions that just came in from our audience this next question is what are the key advantages of using machine learning techniques to manage communication networks over traditional approaches? What do you think the advantages could be? Uh, thank you. This is also a very, uh, very important question. Um, if you look at the traditional uh, techniques we use to, for managing and control network, then we have, um, for example, we look at the control, uh, we have um, uh, control theory, we have optimization um, uh, techniques, and they are, those are very well established mathematical uh, um, um, techniques we can apply for uh, to communication networks. There are a couple issues there. First of all, often, when, let's say we focus on optimization, often, um, we really need to have a good um, uh, set of parameters. That means the network parameters must be, I'm talking about a communication network, I'm not talking about a neural network. The, the parameter you want to uh, associate with the control of your communication network must be available. And those system parameters may not be uh, accurately uh, estimated or they may change over time. <laughs> so at this moment, oh, this is the, how much traffic load you have, but it's not stationary. Maybe a, one hour later, uh, now it's in Singapore is about um, five o'clock. So your, your business hour is about to uh, end. So you can see the traffic load on your internet is reduced. So there's non-stationarity of the issue. So that means if you use a traditional way um, um, to do optimization-based uh, management, then the, when the parameter changes, uh, then you have to rerun your algorithm. We, you have to rerun your, your, your optimization again to get to the optimal um, uh, setting you want to control. But if you use um, dynamic control, uh, dynamic learning capability, then it's almost automatically, especially reinforcement learning, you can learn you can adjust your parameters as time goes on. <laughs> so, so it's a very dynamic uh, environment. So, um, so that's one aspect. Um, the, the, other, the other aspect is um, uh, the, uh, our mathematics have uh, limitation. You know, if you look at the optimization, we have convex optimization, non-convex optimization, but we have, some, we have, we have limited uh, capability in writing down the relationship among the, um, uh, the parameters. Um, but for machine learning techniques, you don't need to write it down. You know, there's some relationship we don't need to know. Uh, we, know to, uh, we don't know how to express mathematically, but it's somehow embedded, uh, captured in your neural network. And that is uh, perhaps enough from the, from, the, uh, from the application perspective. But of course, we would like to understand better the mathematical, uh, uh, have the mathematical understanding behind uh, machine learning techniques. That is the challenge for the research community to work together. Okay, we are still, in many cases, uh, machine learning techniques are still represented as a black box and it works, but we need to understand more than why it works. Uh, we, uh, uh, more than just uh, working, we need to understand why it works, under what condition it would work, one under what condition it would break uh, so that we can have a um, much more robust uh, system design. Thank you, Prof, for uh, sharing your perspectives on that question.
we have another question here. And this one is, how can we overcome the issue of not having suitable data sets to drive reinforcement learning for network management? How can we do it? Uh, well, this is also a, an important, uh, important question. Um, um, we often um, uh, run into this kind of uh, issue, uh, namely lack of suitable data set to train. Uh, but fortunately, I would say the following. As far as the management and control of communication network is, control, is, is concerned, um, we don't have much difficulty in um, uh, collecting appropriate uh, measurements um, data for 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 uh, to drive our reinforcement learning algorithm. Uh, of course, um, if we want to measure something, it requires some effort. It requires our system uh, communication system designer to put some hooks to take some measurements to reflect. You know, for example, if I take certain action, what's the performance gain I can get to reflect the reward? So. Those things need to be implemented. Otherwise, we cannot we cannot uh, have enough um, measurements and uh, data set uh, to drive the reinforcement learning. So, other than other than um, uh, having those hooks uh, uh, in your in in your system, in your networks, um, the rest is not um, that. Um, uh, I mean, fundamentally challenging. I would say <laughs> it, it doesn't matter whether we can do it or not. And secondly, um, uh, the measurements we are talking about is um, is different from uh, quantum physics. You know, if you take the measurement, the, the state of the system changes. <laughs> I mean, for our communication network, it's still classical uh, physical system. So measurements will not perturbate uh, our, our system state. So in that sense, it's a relatively stable uh, uh, system. We can we can take some good measurements. Yes, indeed. You know, um, um, system uh, level uh, measurements and observations will be needed, but um, uh, but no pain, no gain. You know, if we don't measure enough, um, observe enough, then we won't be able to have a uh, good control, good management uh, schemes uh, developed for uh, communication networks or for any other application as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof, for that very comprehensive answer. The last question, uh, we have another question here that just came in and it's this. Is there any data set regarding RIS features in wireless communication through the RL approach? Are there? Uh, I think there, um, I, I, I think there are uh, existing uh, data set available um, for wireless, of course, depends on what aspect of wireless uh, you are talking about, and also you know um, related to that is also not only wireless but also uh, for mobile com uh, communications, uh, mo mobility. For example, uh, some people capture mobility uh, looking at uh, you know um, how uh, vehicles move around. You know, then there's some data set you can you can uh, available to you. And uh, and also I I understand that some uh, operators, some service providers provide their data uh, or provide their data set regarding the um, um, uh, the traffic load um, of um, their base stations and uh, their cellular network. So if you contact me uh, uh, off uh, by email, I I should be able to point you to some of those. And also, you can search on the internet. So uh, there are data sets available uh, related to wireless network uh, that you can use uh, to, to drive your, your reinforcement learning. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kin K. Leong, for helping to answer all those questions from our audience. And of course, for that in-depth look into deep reinforcement learning for control of large-scale communication infrastructures.